Uh, my name is Jackie. Um, I am one of the vocalists for our praise band. Um, not typically the church hype girl, but uh, she's on vacation this week, so um, I'm stepping in and uh, hoping to fill her shoes just a little bit. Um, even though you know that's that's her job, she self appointed her uh, herself uh, April as the church hype girl. But I'm gonna do my best uh, to get everyone pumped up for church because that's what we're here to do. Um, church is not something that we view as a duty, as a, something to check off a checklist. It is an opportunity. Um, it is a gift that we have, a chance for us to enter into the presence of a holy God and celebrate and worship Him together. And uh, we are just so glad that you are here to enjoy that with us together. And uh, as we enter into this time of worship, we just ask that you just prepare your hearts and your minds, and we just um, we ask that that you are open um, to hear the message that uh, that we have today. We are just so thankful uh, that you are here um, because it means that that you felt the nudge to be here. Whether someone um, asked you to come with them, whether uh, someone forced you to come with them, we're just glad that you're here. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, no matter what you believe, you belong here. Um, and we are just so thankful that you're here with us this morning. I'm going to have Pastor, Pastor Chris to come up um, to speak for just a minute before we get started. All right, good morning, everybody. Is anybody excited to be in this gymnasium today, here to worship God? I'm excited you're here, just like Jackie said, we're so glad you're here to worship with us today. We know there's so many options out there, we're so thankful you chose to come here today to worship with us. We are honored to have you here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say, first of all, uh, of course, welcome, and if there are any first-time guests here, we want to say an extra special welcome to you, RCC, put your hands together for our first-time guests. On all the tables, you will see a couple different things. You'll see the cards and you'll see the bucket. Okay, the bucket is for your offering if you feel so glad to give to the ministry here at RCC. Um, and then you see the three cards there. Those are connection cards. If you've never filled out one of those connection cards with your information, uh, I encourage you to do so today. If you fill those out for the first time today and take them over to our church merch table, we have a free gift for you over there. You can either do that in person or you can do it by scanning the QR, QR code on there and just let them know you did that for the first time today. So there's not only the connection card, there's also a prayer card if you have any prayer requests. And if you want to if you want to step up and be a volunteer and be a part of what's going on here at RCC, those are there as well. Um, so speaking of volunteers, there's something where we're getting it in at the very last moment. I understand that, but we do have a July volunteer spotlight today. Um, something we love to do here at RCC is celebrate our volunteers, celebrate those who put so much work in, into what happens here. And it would take us literally forever to celebrate every single one of you every single day. So we're going to do one a month. Last month, you know, we, we celebrated Fred and Emma Brooks, and we're so excited that, that, that they're so involved with everything here. This month, for the month of July, for the July Spotlight, we have Hannah Garner. You can come up or you can stay. It's up to you. She's coming up. Hannah is very much involved with our kids program. Uh, she's such an awesome helper. Very dedicated to the vision God has here at RCC. Give it up for Hannah. Look, we have a couple gifts for you. There's a gift certificate to get some of the best pizza in town. And if you go over to our merch table, you can get a mug and a t-shirt of your choice. Thank you for everything you do. Let's give it up one more time for him. All right, I'm going to give it back over to Jackie, and we are going to stand and worship together. Um, a little bit of a different format today. After the first song, all the kids are going to be dismissed to their class, uh, and then we're going to move forward with service. So, teachers, if we didn't get that information to you, you have it now. <laughs> One song and then we're going to dismiss all the kids. So let's work. Can we stand and worship to this morning?
awesome. Let's give God one more hand clap of praise. It is exciting to be in God's house today. Amen. How cool was it that we have church in a gymnasium in the middle of Martinsburg? How many kids get to say they get to go to class in a bowling alley? Come on, this is exciting stuff, right? God is taking the things that seem ordinary and he's making them extraordinary. The things that seem natural and he's making them supernatural. That we can come together today in this community building and worship him. How awesome is that? It's awesome. As our kids head off to Club Reignite, I encourage you to give someone a high five, a hug, or a nice sturdy handshake and say, I'm so glad you're here. And then you can go ahead and grab a seat. guys today. Uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Chris Garrison. I am so blessed to be the pastor of this awesome group here. Uh, it is my honor to be here with you today. Just keep going. Pretend you're not there. Okay, he's not there. Okay, so I want to talk to you just for a minute. If you were here last week, you know service went a little bit different because uh, we, we were actually challenged because uh, a lot of our praise band uh, was on vacation and, and taking care of some things and they weren't able to be here. Uh, and, and we appreciate them so much, right? It was a noticeable difference, okay? But I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of love how the service was kind of raw and, and it was kind of different, you know, and we had to rely on different things. And I really think, uh, it, I like that we are challenged in the way that we worship, right? That we don't, not that we don't appreciate you guys, okay? But we don't need a band to worship God. Isn't that right? Like, we can, we can still do it, right? That's okay. I'm not saying you, you, have to, you have to come back every week, though, guys. I'm not, I'm not dismissing you, okay? But it's so cool how God works. And the things that sometimes we see as a challenge, God says there's opportunity here. And God showed up, right? God was here last week. I thought it was a pretty cool service. We talked about the purpose and power of prayer, what the secret place of prayer looks like. Um... But all that to be said, we're so thankful our worship band is back this week. One of the things we talked about uh, last week, give me one second, my wife took my laptop and gave me her thing and I'm not sure how to use it. But one of the things we talked about was how prayer is just a conversation. Sometimes we, well now a lot of times, we overcomplicate things. Especially the spiritual things. And I think it's because we, we see that word spiritual and we think it's so far above us. And, and while it's true that the scripture says that God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours, that is absolutely true. The spiritual things are ours. Did you know that? The, the, the spiritual, the supernatural things. Jesus himself said, I've given you this authority. If you, have, if you have been bold enough to call upon the name of Jesus, if you have repented of your sins, if you have turned to him, if he is your Lord and Savior, you have spiritual authority. And if you didn't know that, now you know that. Okay? And so, you know, sometimes we forget. I forget about it. I'm, I'm human too. Where I look at the circumstances in life and think, you know, sometimes life just comes to you. Well, you know what? We're really not supposed to live that way. Because Jesus has given us the keys. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's literally a conversation. Let's not overcomplicate it. It's just like a conversation between two people. It's a conversation between us and God. And, and just like my wife reminds me all the time, a good conversation takes two involved. TWO takes two people involved. And a conversation isn't just one talking and one listening. It involves talking and talking and listening and listening and acting upon it, right? So my wife and I, by the way, pray for her. She's not feeling well. I think she might be on a van somewhere. Uh, she, we, have, we do have a wonderful marriage. I always know what she is thinking because she always tells me. And she always knows what I'm thinking because she tells me that too. Okay, so let's, let's get to our scripture before I get myself in more trouble. This is a scripture that we've talked about recently, okay? But you know how sometimes God just won't let you alone about something? And it's like, I feel like God keeps bringing me back to this, you know, 
I would take calling them stories because we're talking about literal history when we read the, the Bible, right? These things really happened, okay? But for the sake of it, let's call it a story. When it, we hear this story about the, the Israelites going up against the Red Sea, and we talk about it, and sometimes we, we talk things to death. But at the same time, I also believe that God can show you something new, okay? And why, even if it's not necessarily new, maybe God wants today to be a service that is less of a message and more of a prophetic statement over this church. You all right with that? Well, even if we're not all right with it, here it comes, okay? So let's read it. Exodus 14, verses 10 through 15. I'm going to read the scripture. I'm going to, I'm going to start giving you some context here and maybe some of the things that we've always known about this scripture, maybe some things we haven't, um, and then what I feel God has given us here today at RCC. All right. So when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their heart, lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. I'll give you a tiny bit of a, a tiny nugget here. They're escaping slavery from Egypt. Okay, the Israelites are gone. God's like, get them out of here, Moses. So Moses is leading them out. They're about to come up against the Red Sea. They're about to come up against something impossible. They're about to come up against something that they, well, here we'll see. I'm getting ahead of myself. It says, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. They're not talking about the Egyptians. God's people, it doesn't just say they were a little scared. It doesn't even say that they were afraid. It says that they feared greatly. You really want to break that down? They feared so much that they felt like they were going to die. Okay? And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And I like how verse 11 then goes to, and then they said to Moses, so the people, God's people, cried out to God, and then they went on to complain to Moses, all right? You know, church people sometimes, but hey, listen. It says, they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt? Listen to the sarcasm coming out here. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die out here in this wilderness? Is the cemetery full, so you drive us out here into the middle of nowhere? They say, what have you done to us in bringing us up out of Egypt? They're complaining to Moses about him helping to free them from slavery. It's crazy. Verse 12 says, Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? This is the people of God talking to their leader Moses. Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this wilderness. They're saying we would rather be enslaved than to come out here and have to put our full trust in God. Their, their faith was being put to the test here. They were not doing so well in this moment. But don't you know that even in the moments where our humanity takes over and, and the things that we look around us and we see the circumstances and we see the way that the thing, the, 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 the deck that, or the hand that, that we claim life has handed us, we look around and we see these things and God's going to act anyway. Okay, God does, God does things whenever we are obedient, but God also does things behind the scenes because he knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. He knew the end result here. So Moses says to the people, even through your fear, Moses encourages them and says, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. And then one of the coolest, coolest things in here, these Egyptians you see today, you'll never see them again. Okay, Moses kind of put his neck out there for God, right? Put it, put it on the line to say, you're never going to sit. And did Moses know what God was going to do in that sea? I'm not so sure he did. But he knew that God was not going to stop until the people were fully delivered. As far as Moses knew, they just wouldn't see them anymore. Maybe the Egyptians, would, God would turn them away and they would go back. He had no, I don't think he had any idea that they would eventually be swallowed up in the Red Sea. And so when Moses spoke that out, amazing the power of the things that we say sometimes, as Moses spoke that out, God acted upon that, not that God is at our mercy, but God acted upon the obedience of Moses, quite honestly, and they never saw, nobody saw those Egyptians again. They do deep sea dives to try to find those Egyptians again, if you know what I mean, okay? They were gone. They literally never saw them again. There was never a chance they were going to see them again. And it's such a cool word for somebody here today that whatever is in your past that has been chasing you down, put your trust in God. You'll never have to see them again. Okay? Then he goes on, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. 
There's a good word that we struggle with. We need to shut our mouths sometimes and just let God do what God needs to do. Come on. And it says, the Lord says to Moses, and this is the scripture, part of the scripture I want to talk about today. It says, the Lord then said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. What are you talking to me about this for? You know what to do. Tell them to go forward. The last two words are verse 15. When Moses went to the Lord and asked him what he wanted, what God wanted Moses to tell the people, God came back with two words. Go forward. So church, if I were to ask you today, what is the will of God for this church? Or what is the will of God for you as individuals, as a family, anything like that? What would you say is the will of God for your life and the life of this church? Oh, all right. So you were reading my notes. What is God's will for us? This is something we can overcomplicate as well. And, and sometimes rightfully so, right? We, don't, we come to forks in the road all the time and we don't know what to do, right? And, and, and we wonder, God, what is your will for my life? And yet he's revealed it right here. Now, I'm not going to tell you that, the end, that it's going to say in here, make a left turn on this street, okay? It's not going to tell you that, but this book will tell you how the desires of your heart can match the desires of his heart, and then you're living in his will. Come on, right? What is God's will for us? Have you ever stopped to think about it? We did talk about this briefly last week. If you were here uh, and, and paying attention, those are two qualifications. You've got to be got to pay attention. Uh, I think I mentioned that we can know God's will, again, like I said, because he's given it to us. But the truth is there's a lot in here. There's, even if you take out the, the concordance and the maps, there's a lot in here. And it all contains the will of God. So what is it for us? What is within these pages that is for us? And keep in mind, I'm not talking about... Let me take a step here. I'm not talking about what is God's will for those who do not know Jesus on that personal Savior level. I'm not talking about God's will for those people, okay? Um, it, um, I'm not talking about those who don't have a relationship with God. I'm talking to the Christians. Uh, to those who are bold enough to say they're followers of Christ. And just as a side note, and then I say side note, then I regret saying that because this is probably the most important thing of it all. Those who have not called upon the name of Jesus, the Son of God, for their salvation, I'm here to tell you that knowing God's will for you is easy. It is God's will that you repent of your sins, that you truly accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, because that's where your relationship with God begins. So if you don't have that, I can tell you that God's will for you is to know Him. But for the Christians, for the church, what is his will? It's a mouthful, right? What is his will? But how would you answer that if you didn't know the title of my sermon, you cheaters? How would you answer that for yourself as an individual, for your family, for your church? There are probably as many answers to that question as there are people in this building today. Uh, answers such as, uh, well, it's God's will for us to win souls, to build the kingdom of God, right? To draw people closer to the Lord, draw, allow ourselves to be drawn closer to Him, uh, to give more, to do greater service to God and the church, to be a better spouse, to be a better parent, to be a better Sunday school teacher, to be a better pastor. But probably the words of verse 15 are the heartbeat of what God wants to tell us here today. Go forward. Go forward. The word forward carries with it the idea of advancement, of progress, of, uh, you know, healthy progress, right? In the original Greek, this is what I think is so cool. In the original Greek, whenever God says, tell the people to go forward, here's what it means. It means to pull yourselves up, okay, get off the ground, pull up your tent pegs, okay, and start a journey. Get yourself off the ground, pull up those tent pegs, and start on a journey. Let me give it to you another way. God's saying you've been camped here long enough, it's time to pull up the tent pegs and go forward. It's time to move onward. It's time to move upward. It's time for you to be moving on up. 
do the sun, do a deluxe apartment. We'll explain that to the younger generation later. <laughs> this is what God wants all of us to be doing. Yes, as individuals, yes, as families, but also as a church and the church. And by the church, I just mean the global body of Christ. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But the problem is so many of us are stationary. And I'm not judging. We've all been there. I've been there. I was there last week for a moment, okay? Many of us are stationary. Stationary means we are not moving on our own accord or that we're not able to be moved. We're not capable. And, and I think that's a perspective thing, to be honest. We feel like we cannot move. And sometimes life does that to us, right? It feels like we're stuck in waist-deep mud, and we just can't move. And it just keeps getting higher and higher. Oh my goodness, you ever see the movie The NeverEnding Story? The, the most traumatic scene of my childhood is when that horse... I don't, well, I don't, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> all, all the Gen Xers just, just felt that, that pain that we've all felt when we watched the horse. Anyway, uh, but stationary means we're not moving, we're not capable of being moved. And like I said, life does that. We are fixed. We are stationary. And I'm here to tell you that God doesn't want us to be stationary. He doesn't want us to be stuck. He doesn't want us to not be moving forward. And I want to tell you, though, this is different from when he says to be still and know that I am God. That's more about settling yourself down, recognizing God for who he is and what role he plays in your life. And it's different from when the scripture talks about those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Mount up with wings like eagles, run and not grow weary. This is again talking about recognizing who God is and that his timing is far better than ours. And there's a difference between waiting and hesitating. God has never called us to hesitate. Waiting on God is not, is not the same as waiting for life to just happen. Waiting on God means we get, you get Chris out of the way. Chris needs to get Chris out of the way and leave room for God to speak. We all on the same page? Waiting is not hesitating. We have to trust God's timing, and we need, when he says go, we go. What I'm talking about here is where we are as far as life in general. God does not want us growing stagnant. He wants us to be making progress and moving forward in our faith. He doesn't want us to be stubborn and stationary. He wants us to advance. He wants us to progress. He wants us to constantly be taking steps towards Him. He does not want us to hesitate when it comes to our faith. He wants us to be constantly moving forward in our relationship with Him. If today you can say, my relationship with God has never been better, I say, that's awesome. Take a step forward. If you say, I, I don't even know who this God is, I say, if you have a great opportunity here today, take a step forward. Everybody in between, go forward. Take a step forward. God's message to the church today is the same as the message he had for those people back in Exodus. Go forward. He's telling you, I don't want you to be stationary. Don't be a fixed object. Don't stay stuck in the mud. I want you to go forward. And here's what I believe God wants you to know today. What you'll find, and we'll talk about this in a minute, some of those Israelites literally set up camp. Okay, sometimes we read these Bible stories, as I hate to call them, and, and we think, man, they happen in an instant. Okay? But, the, I mean, the journey from where they were to where, to where the Red Sea was, was a long journey. Okay? So some of them had set up camp. They had become content. They had become satisfied with where they are. And that's why God, you, whenever God says go forward, and all that is packed in there in the Greek, whenever God is actually saying, get those pet pegs out of the ground, come on. Are you seeing how cool this is? Look at God's word. God's word is so amazing. When you, even, you know, even on the surface, but if you just start digging a little bit and seeing what God was trying to say to people in that time, it means so much more. So here's what God has to say to us today. Some of you have been camped out in a place of anger for far too long, and it's time to pull up the stakes and go forward. These are all things that are going to keep us held back. And when we get into the, a little bit further into the message here, you're going to see, hopefully, what, what God has shown me about what happens when we put, leave those tent stakes in the ground and we become content with this. Some of you have been camped out in a place of depression 
for too long, and I'm going to pause there for a moment. And I want to say I'm not in any way, shape, or form making light of depression. I'm not downplaying it. I'm not saying it isn't real. It is very real. I'm also not suggesting that, that as some would, that you don't believe that therapists are bad. No, I don't believe that. I believe you can you can serve Jesus and still have a counselor, okay, and still have a therapist. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. And I'm also not suggesting you don't get help from a doctor and that medicines can't help. There, there's my asterisk today, okay? That's my disclaimer because I don't ever want anybody to get that idea, okay? God put a lot of these things into place to help us. Do they get abused sometimes? Absolutely, just like anything else. Okay, are we clear on that? I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. But what I am saying is that if you're constantly finding yourself in an unending cycle of worry, anxiety, and depression, maybe it's time to do something different too. Maybe it's time to pull up the stakes and move forward. Do you ever pray before you do, you know, just the mundane things of life? Right? I think God is calling us to a whole new level of how we live our lives. To the point where we have to get the understanding that God literally cares where we go to eat for lunch after church today. I know that seems silly, but what if he has a divine appointment set up for you there? What if he has someone there that, what, what if your waitress that day, whenever you talk to her, give her, your, give her the tip, just starts crying and just, you know, talking about how, how what, what is going on in her life. It's happened to me before. It's happened to me before. Almost always when we, we pray and we take God in his word that he literally cares about every little thing that we do. Maybe it's time for us to pull up the stakes of our understanding of how God even works in these things. Some of you have been camped out in the, in the place of bitterness for too long. It's time for you to pull up those stakes and move forward. Some of us have been camped out in a place of laziness or complacency far too long. It's time to pull up the stakes. It's time to go forward. And here's one that can kind of cover all of us. Some of us have been camped out in our comfort zones too long. It's time to pull up those stakes and move forward. we got to go forward. What about the place of contentment and satisfaction? What if we've ground our, our tent stakes into that ground, into that place of what we, we feel satisfied, we feel content with how things are going, but God wants us to take, a, wants to take us to a whole new level. But, but, but God, we just set up hand. God says, pull up the stakes. It's time to go forward. Because God is ready to take you on a journey. Do you believe that this morning? I believe it for you. He's ready to take you out of that place of depression and into a place of joy and real happiness. He's ready to take you out of that place of laziness or complacency and take you to a place of service and power. He's ready to take you out of that comfort zone that sometimes we create that, right? right? Like that's a defense mechanism because it turns into a place of refuge where we can hide from life, that comfort zone. But sometimes we find that we're hiding from his greater purpose for our lives. Because God wants to stretch us. He wants to take us places that we haven't been with him before. Places beyond our wildest dreams. So God says, pull up the stakes. It's time to go. God is ready to take you out of that place of simple satisfaction and contentment. And fill you with a hunger and thirst for him that you've never experienced before. You say, well, I experience it all the time. That's awesome. Let's take it up an notch." Take it up a notch. Because God's going to lead you into a greater dimension of His glory than He ever has before. I hope somebody receives that today. But, but here's the thing. You can't stay in those places camped out if you want to experience the glory and power of God in your life, in your family, in your church, in your community. You cannot stay in that place. If you stay in those places long enough, the enemy will destroy you. Could you imagine? I'm sure most of us know this story. Eventually, God does part the Red Sea, and the Israelites go across, and the sea crashes in on the Egyptians, right? Could you imagine if, if those Israelites had stayed camped there? Oh, I'm not going through there. That looks, that's weird. I can see fish on the wall of water, you know? All those silly cartoons we see about Moses part of the Red Sea. But, but, but it's weird whenever God does things supernaturally sometimes. Whenever God delivers on his promises, sometimes people will say, that looks too weird. I'm just going to stay here and be content. Well, guess what? Pharaoh's army would have had to go through them before they went into the Red Sea and they would have been destroyed. Hands down. 
If you stay in these places that God wants to pull you up out of, if you stay in them long enough, the enemy will destroy you. So the scripture we're using today, again, I've talked about it a lot recently. I think God has something prophetic for this church and also for you personally. So just to back up a little bit, a little more context. The children of Israel have just been delivered from the strong, oppressive hand of Pharaoh. And boy, it's easy to just say that. We have no idea what the complexities really were of that situation. That situa situation of bondage they were in. But what happens then is God, with a mighty deliverance, brings them out of Egypt, brings them out of the land of slavery and oppression. They have started their journey with high hopes and expectations as they were heading towards the land of promise. The land that God has promised them. Anybody here on a journey towards the land that God has promised them? It was this land, it was said in the Bible, that it flowed with milk. And honey, and I think that's one of those things where we get a really cool visual, you know, thing there. Um, but just so you know, there weren't necessarily like raging rivers of honey and milk going through the place, okay? This, it, you know, that may be a little weird, you know, and, and sticky. But it, it, it literally is a picture. <laughs> Don't shake your head at me. <laughs> hey, you know what I'm like. You keep coming back. <laughs> But seriously, here's what's cool about it, okay? Sometimes God wants us to get those visual examples, and, and, and he's using metaphors, similar, you know, things like that. It is a picture of what the promised land is. Milk and honey were symbols of abundance. They were symbols of fertility, okay? So this promised land where God is guiding them is a place where there is no such thing as lack. Anybody, anybody ready? Where there's no such thing as lack, it represents total freedom. Is anybody ready for total freedom? It was the complete opposite of what these Israelites had experienced for years in Egypt. Egypt was slavery. Egypt was a feast, literally, of garlic and onions. Some of you may be okay with that, but... But the promised land was abundance. Milk and honey. Best of the best. Nothing but the best for God's people. So understand that the Israelites knew this promise when they experienced their doubts. Okay, don't get so hard on yourself whenever you start doubting the promises of God. Just take it to Him. Right? Say, God, I'm struggling with this. You told me one thing, life says another. I'm going through that right now, church. Going through it now. But this is what God does. The Israelites are escaping from Egypt with Moses at the lead. And I can't imagine the frustration. They say Moses stuttered, and I think this is why. Okay? Because of the stress that God's people put on him. They had only marched a few days, and suddenly they seemed to be stopped in their journey. The Bible records that they camped out by the sea. So picture it, in front of them is the Great Red Sea. And we, unless you've been there or seen pictures, you can't even imagine. We hear sea and, you know, we're, we're talking like an ocean like Like, you, you know, land is cut to sea on the other side, right? On either side of them is a mountain. So they're facing a sea that they can't cross on their own. Either side of them is a mountain. And behind them is Pharaoh and his army. Everything they, someone's got to get this. Everything they have left behind in their past that it kept them enslaved, that it kept them away from God. Every single thing, even though God was with them the whole way, and they figured that out eventually, okay? That when God says, I'll never leave you and forsake you, even when you're spending time in Egypt, he's there. Even when you're in the wilderness, he may seem distant, but he's there, all right? A raging sea in front of them. Impossible mountains on the other side. Someone just told me the other day, when impossible starts, that's when God starts doing his work. Impossible mountains to cross on either side. And a pathway back to slavery. Destruction is at their heels. Pharaoh and his army are closing in fast. On the surface, sometimes we read this and we think, how could they be so stupid? But isn't this a perfect picture of us? Isn't this a perfect picture? We, I mean, maybe not in a physical way sometimes, okay? But 
God has made us a promise. God has promised them. They knew this promise. They knew the promised land was out there. They knew God was leading them and guiding them. They knew God was pulling them out of slavery. So when, and they had seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And then they stand in front of this sea. Moses says, God's going to part it. And they're like, whatever. You just bring us out here to die. Want us to start digging holes now, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me. We also have to understand the Bible is not exhaustive in what, what they wrote down. I, can you, it says they murmured and complained. I, don't even, I can't even imagine the things that were coming out of their mouths. But on the surface, it seems like hope was gone, right? We can agree with that. We know how it ends up. But it looks like hope is gone, right? It only, to our brains, it would make sense. Hope is gone. Moses is telling us we got to go out into this sea. I don't see a boat, right? And we're going to give you a little bit more context about this in a minute. You'll realize how mind-blowing this really is. We can't cross these mountains. And Egypt's closing in fast. On the surface, it seems hopeless that they're trapped. For all practical purposes, there was literally no out. But in the midst of the chaos and the confusion... The Bible says that people come to Moses and it says they begin to cry out to him. And I'll make that a little more modern, a little more modern for you. They were complaining. Um, and, and as they cry out to him, and I told you all the things, they're like, you just believe us to dead. I'd rather go back to Egypt. I'd rather be eating the garlic, even though God's promised us milk and honey. Moses goes to God and he says, and I'm paraphrasing, this is the Chris Garrison version. God, what do you want me to do here? They're getting ready to stone me. Right? There's a mutiny happening here amongst God's people. These are, if we were to modernize this, these are church people getting ready to destroy their leader. Do not get any ideas. So Moses is saying to God, God, what on earth do you want me to do here? What do you want me to do? And God says, Moses, you already got the answer. Why are you crying out to them? Tell the people to go forward. Go forward. What did that look like to say go forward? Forward was the Red Sea. Tell the people to go forward. Someone here needs this next part. God was saying to them and God is saying to you, I did not bring you out of that life just to let you go back. I did not take you out of that life of slavery. Just to watch you go back there. I did not bring you out of it to leave you stranded now. I did not bring you out so you could set up camp here. This is not the land I promised you. It's part of the journey. But it's not the land I promised you. There is so much more. There is nothing to go back to. So the only choice you have is to what? God wants us to know that lifestyle he delivered you from, that life he saved you from, there's nothing to go back to there. If you go back, you'll be destroyed or you'll be returned to slavery. And I'm telling you, that's true for me, church. I come from a lifestyle of addictions. Just being honest, I have to move forward because backwards is death. Plain and simple. If you're finding yourself in a place where you know you don't belong, if you don't pull up those stakes right now, it is inevitable that eventually you will be destroyed. Eventually Egypt will catch up to you and you will be destroyed. I know that sounds harsh, but I love you. Okay? So what do you do? Two words. Go forward. Remember his goodness. Here's how you do this. Okay? Because a lot of times it's like, God, that's great. It's easy to say go forward, but you don't know the Red Sea I'm facing. And you're right, I probably don't. You don't know the Red Seas that I faced. It's fair. It's fair to, to feel that way, okay? So let me tell you what I do. I remember. I remember the things that God has delivered me from. I remember the journeys God has taken me on. And sometimes those journeys, when I'm in the midst of the journey, I don't see his hand. I don't see his face. I don't feel his presence. I can look back on them right now and say, you know, it's like that footprints in the sand thing that some of you have framed in your houses, okay? But it's true. In that moment, we don't, we don't necessarily feel him. The Israelites did not feel God in the wilderness at all times. God allows that to draw us closer to him. 
to let us understand our dependence on him. So what I do is I remember his goodness. I remember the miracles he's done in my life. It's a miracle I'm even standing here today. I have to remember these things. And these things allow me to go forward knowing that if he's done it in my past, there's no reason I should think that he's not going to part that sea in front of me. Remember the things he's delivered you from. I remember the addictions he's, he's delivered me from. The things he's rescued me from. Saved me from. He has saved my physical life countless times. As a church, and as an individual, as God is telling us, we need to rise up. We need to rise up. We need to move forward and do the things that he has called us to do. Forget about the past. Forget Egypt. Forget the pain and the agony of the past. Bury it in the ground and go forward. Stop hitting snooze on your clock. We need to wake up. We need to stop wallowing in pity and agony and the pain of the past and go forward. I'm not saying the pain isn't real. The pain is real. Knowing Jesus does not always alleviate the pain. And if someone told you that, I'm sorry. But life stinks sometimes. We go through traumatic things sometimes. But God. But God's hand is always in it. He may not prevent the thing from happening, but he shows us a way that he can make something beautiful even out of what we see as a pile of ashes. And if you know, you know. I know the pain is real. I deal with the pain of my past often, but I can't let it drag me back there. We can't get stuck in the past and move forward at the same time. It just can't happen. So we have a choice. We are to be constantly moving forward until Jesus comes back for us. Don't get me wrong, I get it. We get used to these places of nothingness. That it starts to feel comfortable, right? I just want to stay here. I just want to camp out. I just want to enjoy the view. Never mind that this view includes anger and, and bitterness and unforgiveness. We become satisfied with where we have ended up. But God is calling us out of our comfort zones and calling us up out of these places where we've camped out. He wants us to go forward. He does not want us to be destroyed. I want to share with you just a few good reasons to move forward. Rather than stand still or go back, I'm going to go pretty quick here, so make sure you write these down. First of all, when you fail to go forward, the first thing you're going to do, you're going to stop walking by faith and you're going to start living in fear. The minute you stop moving forward or making progress in your spiritual walk, fear will start to overshadow faith. Instead of putting your trust in God and His Word, you'll begin to believe more of the lies of the devil. The devil will put the fear of sickness, death, bankruptcy, failure, etc. All these things into your life when God's Word says that you can have victory over all of these things. I know what this is like. Believe me, if I dwell too long on my current circumstances, I would probably go insane. Look at verse 10. It says, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after. They could see them now. They could see them. Here they come. It says they feared greatly, right? I would imagine they couldn't just see them. They probably heard them on horse, on horseback, the chariots, right? Could you imagine the roar that was coming down after them? It makes sense, honestly, in our human capacity, that they were extremely afraid. But do you see what happened here? See, earlier when they first came out of Egypt, that day, when, the, when they first came out of Egypt, they were going forward to the promised land, right? There wasn't a speck of fear in their hearts. They marched out of there. The word says they were singing these songs of Zion. It was probably like an old school tech revival rolling down through Egypt. I don't know if they had tambourines or not, but I know that people were probably dancing and rejoicing. God was setting them free. They were on their way out of bondage to Canaan, which was the promised land. They were united in their vision and their mission, and they were going forward together. And as long as they were moving in that direction forward, they were full of faith, and everything was going to be just fine. But the minute they stopped going forward, their faith was replaced with fear. 
The minute they got their eyes on their circumstances, everything changed. Now, instead of an army full of faith, singing victory songs of God and marching towards Canaan, they were like scattered sheep that were frightened and crying out in the wilderness because they were filled with fear. And what I want to say to you today is if you're here today and you're filled with fear, if you have for one reason or another camped by the Red Sea of Life and faith is being replaced with fear, God wants you to know that it does not have to end here. You have an opportunity right here and right now to pull up the stakes and go forward. And let's be honest, it's easy to enjoy where we are, to be satisfied with where we are, but that's not what God wants for us. He wants to replace fear with faith, and that comes with moving forward. But if you give into that fear, you will eventually start complaining to anyone who will listen. And if people won't listen, we'll just put it on Facebook, right? Mm-hmm. For the people of God that we're talking about in the scripture, though, it didn't take long before fear replaced their faith. And then the complaining started setting in. They started complaining to Moses. That's in verses 11 and 12. They said to Moses, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you took us out here into this wilderness to die? They said, didn't we tell you in Egypt, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve them than to die in the wilderness. In verse 11, they blame all their problems on Moses because they don't want to assume any responsibility for themselves. Here we find them, instead of being a marching, victorious army, they're standing there, and here's the word, murmuring and complaining against Moses and the God who just delivered them. And let me just say this, and I'll move on before you turn on me. <laughs> when you are going forward with God, when you are going forward with God, up front, where the action is, you don't have time to complain. When you're spending time with God in prayer, when you're in His Word and making progress in your spiritual journey, you'll find there's no room for complaining. It doesn't mean things aren't wrong, right? We live in a broken world sometimes. There's something wrong. Life isn't always pleasant. Things don't always go our way. But when we're going forward and we have our eyes on the promised land that God has promised us, our whole perspective changes. Amen? Here's the next point. i got two more. When you stop going forward, inevitably you're going to start looking back. They said to Moses, why don't you just take us back to Egypt? It would be better for us if we were back in Egypt. Can you imagine that? They had just been brought out from the literal whips of Pharaoh, and within two or three days, they're standing there saying, we would have been better off there. I can't imagine why anybody would want to go back to Egypt, the world, sin, bondage, slavery, but at the same time, I get it, because the world can be very enticing, and the devil will use every dirty move he can to get us to keep looking over our shoulders. But the bottom line is, if we ever stop going forward, eventually we are going to go backward. You ever find yourself missing some of the things of the past? And I'm not talking about the good old days and, and things like that. I'm talking about the things of the past that held us back, that were harmful to us, things that God has delivered us from. Maybe God set you free from addictions of various kinds, but you find yourself looking over your shoulder saying, I guess it wasn't that bad. Maybe God delivered you from relationship issues. Yeah. Wasn't that bad. Right? You ever, you ever find yourself wishing you could go back and do some of the things you used to do? When the past looks better than the future, you stop moving forward. Here's my last point. If you aren't going forward, you're more than likely hindering somebody behind you from going forward too. Turns out you aren't the only person you hurt when you make poor choices. I have learned that hard lesson many times in life. Here's some more context for your story. We read this story of the Egyptians escaping Egypt and the Red Sea and all of that, but we miss the fact that there were several million people. Several million people escaping Egypt. Sometimes we read this story and I think in our heads we see it as a dozen or so, maybe a hundred people, maybe 150. Millions of people were in that valley. Did you realize that? So I want you to think about this. Picture the, picture the million people, right? The people in row 50 
can't go anywhere until the people in the first row move forward. Does that make sense? Like if you're in a group that big and you're in line, just like you're waiting in line for, if you're late, waiting in line at Mamie's, and it seems like millions of people are in line in front of you, okay? And all you want is that promise of a donut. But if that person doesn't move forward, you're stuck. So, so what's the point of that, right? What, what's my point there? There are a lot of people in your life and my life standing behind us, watching and waiting for us to make the right move, because whether you know it or not, you're all leaders. People are standing behind, waiting to see us move, watching to see if we're going to move forward. And if we don't, they're stuck behind us. You guys all right back there? <laughs> Don't start protesting yet. <laughs> Listen to me, I'm almost done. Moms and dads, there are children watching, waiting for us to get on the right path and start moving forward. I wonder how many people are standing behind us just waiting for us to make the right move, to take the right step, to exercise the right kind of faith before they move. We're all leaders. Someone's always watching. And if you're thinking, well, you know what? Those people behind me can't use that as an excuse not to move forward. You are 100% correct. But whether we like it or not, people are watching us, and if we aren't moving forward, they won't go forward. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to hold anybody back from their purpose and destiny that God has for them. So who's standing behind you waiting? As a church, we won't move until the pastor does, until the board does, until the leadership team does, until the teachers move. But guess what? Someone has to start. Someone has to begin to move forward. Can you imagine what will happen if we all did that together? If we all move forward together? You know, it's bad enough to think that I might be at a standstill in my own life, but to think that I'm preventing somebody else for making progress in the kingdom of God. I don't want that on my hands. This is my last point as the praise band comes up and if whoever's supposed to go let the kids know, they can come back in and join us for worship, okay? Here's your last point. When you fail to go forward, you prevent yourself from seeing the miraculous. When you don't go forward, you're gonna miss the miracles. And you say, God, I don't know about this going forward thing. There's a big C in front of me. How are we going to get across it? I think I'll just stay here where it doesn't require risk, where it doesn't require faith. And God told Moses, you tell these people to start moving forward. You take that rod and you stretch it out over the sea. You're going to move. And when Moses obeyed and took the first step and did what God told them to do, the winds began to blow, the waters began to roll back on every side, and God said to them, Do not be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. God always moves when we are willing to obey Him and take that step of faith that He asks of us. How many times in the Bible does it say when the priest did this or when the trumpet sounded or when the army shouted, God did miraculous things. But we get it backwards. We say if God would do something, then I'll do something. But I'm telling you, it doesn't work that way. God says, take me at my word. Step out on the water. Come on. Go forward. And when you do, I'll cover you with my hands. And when you do, I'll see you through it. When you do, I'll do something miraculous. He's waiting on us. And if you're willing to take the step to go forward, God will part that sea and he will destroy your enemy. He will do the miraculous and you'll never have to lay your eyes on it again. So what's God's will for this church? And what is God's will for you? Two words, right? What are they? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you're here with us today. Thank you so much that we can worship you in, in freedom and worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we thank you so much 
that even when we face these impossible mountains and these raging seas and our past closing in on us, that you just want us to go forward and trust you. So God, today as a church, I say we're going forward. We are moving forward, knowing that you will part the waters of any circumstance that we face. And God, I'm praying that for myself, I'm praying that for my family, and I'm speaking that over every single person in this building. Thank you so much, God, that your promises are always true. Thank you that your word says you're not a human, you're not a man, that you lie, and when you promise us something, you will not relent on it. Thank you, God, for sometimes chasing us down to bless us. Thank you, God, that you desire to bless your people. Thank you, God, that even whenever it feels like death, you are bringing life if we would just go forward. So, God, I thank you for our time together. I thank you, God, that we are going to worship our way out of this building today. Thank you for our kids that are going to join us again. And, God, thank you that you have carved out this bit of time in church history for us to gather together in this skating ring just to worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to worship. Now, come on in, kids. Kids are going to join us. But I want to tell you something. If you feel like you need prayer for any reason at all, Meet us over at the pool table during worship or after service, and we would be honored to pray with you. And I search the
thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified
constantly for your support on that um, and your prayers with that. So um, on, 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 a, on a park level note, uh, just because everybody's been asking me, I, I have officially been uh, named to the board of directors of here at Morrison Scott Board. So you can all get into bingo free next year. That's the only perk. Okay, so over there we have our church merch table. Make sure you check that out. Uh, we have t-shirts, we have stickers, we have awesome coffee mugs. Um, while you're over there, we do have a back to school drive, okay, where we're, we're, we're really excited about this because part of our vision at RCC is reaching the world around us, and that includes the students going back to school and the teachers going back to school. So there's a way that you can participate in that, and I ask you to go over there by the merch table and talk to the ladies over there about how you can help support that. Um, also, while you're over there, we do need some additional volunteers for our First Impressions team. Um, that does not mean you have to iron my shirt in the morning, okay? The First Impressions team would include, like, greeters and parking lot attendants and just everybody that is the first smiling face that you see here at the church. We would love for you to be a part of that. So I, uh, check out our group over there. Um, real quick, I got one more, one more announcement. August 7th, I believe that's a Monday, next Monday. Uh, they're, we're having a uh, part of our RCC Summer Fun Day. Fifth grade and under are invited over to the Copco's house. If you don't know where the Copco's live, it's kind of where the whole pizza church thing started. Small town pizza, okay? So uh, see Stacy Copco for more information on that. But it's fifth grade and under. There's going to be food. You can go swimming, things like that. It's going to be awesome. Uh, look for more information on that event and more on our Facebook page. That's all I got for you. Are you blessed today? Yeah. And when you leave here, go be a blessing to someone else, all right? God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.